Been a little bit distracted lately from my Mega 65 obsession to the newest retro computing fad on the YouTubes, the Nabu personal computer. I'm not gonna go into the history of the Nabu computer, but I've shared my unboxing, first use, and how to build a cable to connect your Nabu to the internet. My, my experience with the device has been quite interesting. And in this post, I wanna share 10 things about the Nabu that surprises this Commodore computer fan. And a few of them will probably surprise you too. So let's dig in. Hey, before we dig in, don't forget you can support the channel by going to buymeacoffee.com slash retrocombs. Join at various memberships at these fun Commodore inspired levels all the way from the pet to the Mega 65. So be sure and check that out. Hey, and if you're so inclined, don't forget to hit all that business down below. You can like, subscribe, and leave a comment. Let me know what I missed in this video. Hey, and also, if you don't want to support as a member, go ahead and hit that, that little thank you button down there, that thanks button. That's a good way to support the channel too. Now let's look at the 10 things about the Nabu that surprised this Commodore enthusiast, starting with the Nabu's industrial design. The Nabu form factor and case design is substantial when you compare it against a Commodore computer of the same period. As a matter of fact, Commodore's bread bin cases look kind of toy-like next to the rugged metal VCR sized Nabu case. You can tell the designers of the Nabu created a set-top box computer to look at home in an audio-visual rack with 1980s videotape recorders and hi-fi equipment. And then they dangled a long cable out the back of the box to connect the keyboard. Let's look at the keyboard next. At first glance, the 66-key QWERTY keyboard with ALPS key switches kind of looks bulky, but the lengthy cord hanging off its backside makes sense if you want to operate the computer on your TV from your sofa. The Nabu's keyboard layout is odd, even for a 1980s computer, and includes yes, no, go, rewind, and fast forward keys. These keys were likely included to make the computing experience more intuitive to new users. The keyboard key action is a welcome surprise. In a word, the keyboard feels outstanding. The Alps keys provide a nice thunk that reminds me of early Apple keyboards. It feels professional and is a keyboard that I want to use, a statement I rarely say with retro computers. Finally, the keyboard includes ports for two joysticks, and those ports are my next surprise. I'll admit, when I heard the Nabu was a cable company contraption, I assumed everything would be proprietary, including connectors. DJ Schurz used a Nabu joystick in his video, and I need to find me one of these. And I assume because of its unique flight stick appearance that the connector on the other end would be proprietary. To my surprise, the back of the keyboard includes two DB9 connectors, the same connectors found on the Atari, TI, and Commodore computers. My Hyperkin Trooper and Competition Pro joysticks feel right at home with the Nabu. Now, I've not tried the Hyperkin Ranger paddle controller, but nothing leads me to believe it won't work except for paddle support in software. I have to check with the Nabu network to determine if there are any paddle controller games. The Nabu network is critical to the operation of the Nabu personal computer. Last year, when boxes of Nabus first appeared, the only reason anyone would want to purchase one was for their historic value. Unbox it. Turn it on, and the only thing the Nabu would do is display a logo followed by an adapter failure message. I personally passed on the first round of boxes since there was only a hope that one day the community might reactivate the network, but, and I, and I would say in record time, that happened. By the time the next round of Nabu boxes were available, users only needed to connect a USB RS-422 adapter to a modern PC, wire up a cable, load some free software, and the Nabu network lights up. These previously dormant Nabu personal computers were now live. And once the network is live, the surprises about the Nabu continue as you view retro advertising load pages while the original Nabu software streams to your device. The Nabu software delivery system was much more advanced compared to its contemporaries. No longer did the user have to visit a computer store to purchase software. It sounds like an app store before the app store. While Commodore had its own computer network called Quantum Link, 
which would in 1989 become our favorite America Online. You've got mail. There's no way for us to relive the glory of those days of that online service. And that's too bad. But if you want to experience another network contemporary, that's where the Naboo comes in. And when you fire up the Naboo network, that's where the other surprises begin. I imagine in the 1980s, families loaded and ran software from the Naboo network. There was a floppy disk controller, but these were rare among normal consumers. It appears Naboo provided free software and users could opt to purchase additional titles. I assume when the original network ceased, so did ownership of these software titles and imagine that families were none too happy at the loss of their software investment. In 2023, users can experience the Naboo's small list of software titles without cost. You'll quickly mow through the titles available and find that they are mediocre, even for their time. There are faithful recreations of games and productivity apps such as word processors and, of course, the requisite basic programming language, but they aren't great. That's where exploitation of the hardware comes into play. The Naboo uses some standard hardware that's found on other contemporary computers, and that hardware includes a Zilog Z80A 8-bit 3.58 MHz clock speed processor, 64 kilobytes of RAM, 16 kilobytes of video RAM, a Texas Instruments TMS 9918A, a General Instruments AY38910 programmable sound generator. These specifications are an awful lot like Japanese MSX computers, a 1983 home computer architecture used by several vendors and created by ASCII Corporation. The Naboo has additional capabilities and compatibility when you replace the Naboo ROM with an MSX ROM. Games are more refined, responsive, and true to the original arcade counterparts. And thanks to Cloud CPM, you can now switch out ROMs and try many games and software originally not available on the Naboo. The Naboo didn't really come with a user operating system. The company sent software through the coaxial cable network. In 2023 though, with no external storage available yet, DJ Shures figured out how to hack Visual Research's CPM OS on the Naboo. This version of CPM called Cloud CPM adds productivity and geek tools to the Naboo. DJ has even hacked in an 80 column scrolling display. It's a blast to use with various drives. You have A drive, B drive, C drive, and user areas within those drives serving as software collections. For some fun, check out drive B and user one for an assortment of MSX games ported to the Naboo. When you're on the A drive, type summary to see a list that's updated regularly. Try typing news to check the latest features of cloud CPM. Running CPM in the cloud ensures you always have the latest version. It's actually quite slick. Now, CPM was available for Commodore computers in the mid-1980s, and the Commodore 128 had its own version. However, the Naboo version is more convenient and, based on what I've heard, more full-featured. But pulling software from a server is not the only way to run applications on the Naboo. Again, thanks to software from Geek with Social Skills and DJ Shures, we can download titles from the network via the internet from different channels. But that's not the only way. You can download .nabu files to run locally using software such as the internet adapter software from Nabu Networks. This will suffice until development continues on the new hardware that will emulate local storage for old and new software. And not content with the Nabu's original capabilities, software and hardware developers are creating new projects to extend functionality using modern programming techniques and hardware components. For instance, on the software side, you can look for Game Man Yay, homebrew four-player space miner game, or Brick Battle, which is a homebrew two-player brickout clone with multiple balls. Finally, there's Cloud GUI. Think Geos for the Naboo, but not really, but kinda, but not really, but sorta. I'm keeping my fingers crossed that we will soon have an inexpensive ESP32 board to connect our Naboos to the network via Wi-Fi. In the meantime, if you don't have a Naboo, you know what? You still have options. It surprised me to learn that Naboo emulation was available through the use of MAME software. Yes, that MAME, the multiple arcade machine emulator we use to play our favorite retro console titles. 
Now, if you're a Windows user, you can download a complete Nabu emulator package. And after you read the instructions, you'll have an emulator of the Nabu personal computer running. I do have links down in the video description below. Now, I'm sure Mac and Linux versions are coming soon to provide a free way to experience the Nabu. However, maybe you just want to buy a real Nabu. Cost for a Nabu is probably the most surprising entry on my list. The retro computing hobby is expensive, and when boxes of Nabu units surfaced, I expected the owner wanted to make a buck or two on his find. But you know, that's simply not the case. You can purchase a Nabu on eBay, link down below, for $80 plus shipping. You'll spend around $100 for the unit, and then you'll need a, another few bucks to build a cable with some additional components. And I've got all that information as well for you. Or you can purchase a pre-built cable from Arcade Shopper. All in all, though, you won't spend more than about $150. I think that's a lot of retro computing goodness and fun. I'm calling this the best $150 or less you'll spend on a retro computing system this year. You're getting a almost mint in box unit from the 1980s delivered to your house for 150 bucks. Wow, that's pretty good. So that's the top 10 things that surprise me. But as you know, if you've seen any of my other top 10 lists, I always throw in a bonus. And the bonus on this one is very surprising. It's the community. Now, there are many NABU owners in the growing community, and you can check out the NABU serial numbers to see if you know anyone in that community. As followers know, I'm fond of the Mega 65 community. They are a generous bunch of folks with very low drama. I'm new to the NABU community, and I can't yet vouch for its health. There's been a little drama lately, and I'm keeping my fingers crossed that all involved will figure it out. What I can tell you, though, is that within the community, I found helpful folks who have joined my live stream chats, made comments on my videos, and helped me solve problems. And if you want to interact with other Nabu users, join the Nabu Discord server, or when you support my channel and blog by becoming a member, you can join my Nabu channel on my Discord. I'll make sure that's a friendly, low-drama area for you. And finally, you'll find friendly folks who want to help you in the RetroNet chat, which is really cool in itself, or on the Nabu IRC. So there you go. There's my 10 surprising facts about the Nabu from this Commodore fan. If you like this video and you want to learn a little bit more about the Mega 65, check out this link right here. However, if you want to learn a little bit about, more about the Nabu and dig in, check out this one. At this time, Retrocombs out.